Seven Financial Habits That Will Change Your Life. It's Brian Preston, The Money Guy. Uh, I'm so excited about these seven financial habits for a number of reasons. One, we sit in a very unique position uh, that we've both been fortunate and been blessed to have some financial success, and we ha- know some habits that we both exhibit ourselves. We also are fee-only financial planners, so we get to work with a number of successful financial individuals. But this is what I like the most about it. We were actually able to go through these, and I personally, as we were going through these show notes, I was like, was that something I do? Oh, yeah, maybe. Oh, no. Oh, maybe I need to improve that. Right. Uh, and I thought it was a beautiful self-assessment. So what I would hope that our audience would do is the same thing, kind of do a self-assessment and say, are these habits that I am actually carrying out in my day-to-day life? I thought you were excited because we mixed it up a little bit and we're doing this David Letterman style where we're going from descending down to what we consider the most powerful mm-hmm. habit you We're going to do, do a countdown instead of a count up. Exactly. Yeah, so that we're starting, and, and that's probably a great transition. By the way, we never give the intro anymore. This is the Money Guy Show, so I want you at moneyguy.com. We're going to be talking about at the end of the show, too. We have a brand new resources page. Mm-hmm. Guys, if you're not going and checking this out, it's incredible. All the things we talked about that we were going to email you, we were like, why let that stuff get buried in somebody's email inbox? Let's let the resources sit there 24-7 so That's you right. have access. So go to moneyguy.com backslash resources. I don't think you'll be disappointed. So let's jump right into this. Number seven, which is be a lifetime learner. Now, this is the one, Bo, I, I got to tell you, because I, there's always content out there that says 85% of millionaires have this habit in common. Yeah. You're like, 85% do this. What, uh, what is that thing? And you're me like, I, I want to be in that. I want to do yeah, that. If, so you're if like, millionaires do well, it, I want to do it's it. It's funny you say that. Because the habit that 85% of millionaires supposedly do is they read two plus books a month. Now, okay. Walk. Guys, no, 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 no. Hang on, hang on. Let me set this up. Bo and I like to try to protect you guys from things that we think may be a little bit of wonky or iffy. Yeah, of course. So we, in our decision to research this, signed up for an executive book club mm-hmm. where we were getting two books a month. So we're going to read. On, on leadership and business and how to be just a tycoon. Because I know everybody's heard this stat. Oh, yeah. Like, so here's what I have come from after this year extravaganza of book reading is that I felt like Lucille Ball <laughs> making pies. Is Because the first month, you're like, okay, if I just read this many pages a month, I will easily make it through. So the first box shows up, you 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 really try, but then life is You get is excited, going man. On. You get hot and heavy, yeah, and you have so your you're, reading you're plan. Through, and... But then you're not even through the first book, and then the second box shows up with two more books, and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's more books coming. <laughs> and then after that, you've given up usually by month three, but the books keep on coming. I mean, they're falling off the conveyor belt. So here, here's my point on this is that I think that that stat sits out there by people who are selling these executive right. book clubs. That's exactly what right. I really think the better point with number seven is, is to be a lifetime learner. I don't know that I buy into the 85% of millionaires are reading two books a month. They might be buying two books a month <laughs> because they're part of some executive reading program. But it is one of those things where I think you need to be curious. I think you said that exactly right. It's the curiosity that is the habit. They want to continue to better themselves. They want to continue to expand their knowledge, even if they're doing it through maybe some non-traditional ways. It could be podcasts or YouTube videos or experiences or whatever. They do want to continue to add to their uh knowledge tool belt. Now, I I do want to put one disclaimer out there because you and I have thrown around. I would love, there is something, because remember, I'm this whole thing started as I wanted to be in a, create an online classroom. I do think there would be nothing more fun than going through books like The Millionaire Next Door, Wealthy Barber, Everyday Millionaires, but we would slow it down where we, if we had a book club, it would be we'd go over it over like two months because I really <laughs> being, book, being honest with nice you guys, slow. I probably because you audited me on this. I probably do read four to five books a year. I don't read twelve no. to twenty four. I mean that's just that's a lot of books. I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say neither do I read twelve <laughs> books a year. We're just gonna <laughs> leave it at that. Here's the other thing I think that is really interesting that we found with successful people as it relates to being a lifetime learner, they also learn from their failures. Yeah. So in part of learning, whenever they have a misstep or a miscue or something that doesn't go the way that they want it to, 
they don't just give up and walk away sure. and fall over and disappear. They actually use that as a stepping stone to figure out how to improve their circumstances, how to learn from that, how to take that in the next phase. I think even that is an example of being a lifetime learner. Yeah, there's so many opportunities. Even in bad things, you have the opportunity to turn lemons into lemonade. Right. So have that positive half glass is half full mentality and you will continue to be successful. Number six, be efficient with resources. This is, um, you know, look, we all, I think th this is the biggest thing I could tell people. I was talking about this with my, my, my trainer who helps me exercise right. is that we were talking about the 10,000 hours because I told him we'd gone to see Malcolm Gladwell, mm -hmm. the whole 10,000 hours to becoming an expert. He goes, I also do not believe just anybody can be great at anything they want to as long as they practice it. There's also that you have to have talents mm -hmm. that are provided to you that you're born with an aptitude but then the when you start doing your 10,000 hours it awakens That's something right. that allows so it, the the whole point of me mentioning this is that I think everybody out there has something they could truly be world class mm -hmm. in it's a matter of you trying enough things out and then when you find what you're passionate about be efficient with your resources and attack it. Actually go into it and figure out how this can be something that helps you with longer-term goals. Right. Develops the talent to where it's something that's worth a lot of money. There's a lot to this. It rolls into work, it rolls into time, and it rolls into money. That, that's what I was going to say, Brian, is, is that so often when we say be efficient resources, the immediate thought is, oh, these guys are going to talk about how to not waste money and you know right. make wise financials. It's actually a whole lot more than that. Your resource is not just the dollar bills that you have in your pocket, not just the dollar bills that you got in there. It's how you actually employ your time and your talents. And we think that those that are successful figured out how to capitalize in those three areas you said, in their work, in their time, as well as in their finances or their money. So let's kind of hit these really quickly. Mm -hmm. Each one of them work. Guys, if you are, because it is, it's one of those things, we talk about our work family yep. and then our, you know, our, our regular family that was our blood family. Mm -hmm. Work family, you spend a surprisingly large amount of time Absolutely. with your work family. So if you find that you're chewing your fingernails on Sunday and you just don't feel fulfilled, think about that. Because that's something that's probably, you know, something subconsciously knocking on the door telling you, you might need a change. Think very long term and figure out how you use those resources of work efficiently. And when we think about financially successful people that we either work with or that we see, one common thread we see through them is they don't view their work as just simply a job. Yeah. All right, I clock in and clock out. There's some greater purpose. They're working in their job to do something or accomplish something or achieve something, even if it's not like you know some, some world-changing occupation, but they approach it as though in the part they can influence, they can have a very drastic influence, and they work towards that longer-term goal, something kind of bigger than themselves. Sure. It's amazing how when you have that mentality and how you approach your work, how it manifests in all the other areas of your life. That's a good transition talking about time. Yep. Because, Bo, and I think you put this on, we had a whiteboard starting in Georgia, and you scribbled across it. What did you what did you put across I the, said, that whiteboard? Don't get busy doing nothing. And that hit me because I will tell you, I think even when you're moving in the right direction, you can busy yourself with stuff that really is busy work. It doesn't have anything that builds on this huge platform or success or long-term goals that you're trying to build on. I can tell you when I started my company in 2002, I spent a lot of time Balancing checkbooks, reconciling the books, because that was so much easier than trying to go drum up business. Yeah. But yep. I felt like, man, I'm focusing on the business. You know, I'm, I'm spending so my busy. time I in the business. To, yeah. This is good. You No, that was called Brian didn't want to go talk to people to try to get business. Because exactly talking right. to people might lead to rejection, might do. So make sure you're not wasting your time. It's a very valuable resource. We heard, we just, boom pickings. We read oh, yeah, that quote boom pickings, yep. that he said that, you know, he passed away a few months ago and he wrote a letter. And one of the things is he said to college classes, he would give every dollar he had to be sitting in the exact same seat they have because they get to do it all over again right. with Tom. Tom is such a very valuable resource. 
Do not waste it. Yeah, I think so often we see folks who they don't they don't recognize when they're young how valuable time can be. And yeah, we're talking about like compounding interest and that sort of idea. But but even more so, if you don't recognize that the time you put in now can have a huge impact later on, how hard you work in the early years of your career, the things that can set you up later in your career to maybe not have to work so hard or to achieve different levels of success. If you don't realize that, if you're the one of those people that just lets life happen, you are not utilizing your time in the most efficient way possible so that you can maximize really the limited yeah. time that we have here on this earth. And that leads to the last resource that we talk, that we use officially, which is money. Yep. And something I want to talk about this is that, because this interrelates with not only work, not only with time, but also with money, is that, guys, if you're not writing your dreams down, they never have a chance of becoming a reality. Exactly so right. make sure that you are, especially when it comes to things like financial goals, go ahead and create what is that bucket list that I'm hoping to accomplish both in the short term. You know, you could do a year goal, three-year goal, 10-year goal, and let those things, because as soon as you start recording, you wake up something in your subconscious that starts moving the ball forward. Exactly you have right. to have some type of plan. But there's also, what else can you do to be efficient with your resources with money, Bo? Yeah, the thing that we always say is you're, every, every uh, soldier in your army of dollar bills can have a purpose and should have a purpose. We see this all the time where folks leave behind soldiers, whether yep. it's at an old 401k or an old IRA, or maybe you have too much money sitting in cash, or maybe you're just not someone who's recognized that I have a plan for how I'm going to put my dollars to work to ultimately build myself towards financial independence. If you're not utilizing your army, your army's just going to get fat and lazy and you are not going to win the war of financial abundance. So making sure you're consolidating right. and doing things so that every dollar has a plan and you're yep. being a very good field general. I mean, we do things, Shopping Ninja. Oh, it's yeah. one of those things. Now, I want you to, there's a fine line between not getting busy doing nothing, but just making sure that you're not wasting resources. I'll tell you, I've been going on a terror with warranties in my house. <laughs> I bought, and now that's, we didn't talk about this, but it is driving my family crazy is because I have I, a few years ago, I changed every light bulb in the house to LEDs as they went bad. As they went bad, so I don't want y'all to think we threw away perfectly good light bulbs, but I was changing all light bulbs to LEDs. These things are supposed to have five-year life expectancies, right? They're all dying after two years. So I got fed up, and I was like, son of a gun, these things are supposed to last five years. So I went on the website. I just went, all you had to do was I took pictures of these all these light bulbs together, wrote the companies, because it was two manufacturers, I have a whole bunch of brand whole new free. Of light so I'm bulbs. just telling you, you can waste resources. That would probably be considered a waste of getting busy doing nothing, but it, it feels good personally. <laughs> the big things, and that's what I want you to do, is focus on the big things. Right. Like I just renewed my homeowners and an auto insurance. I questioned my broker on what the cost was. I magically got a $900 check in the mail because yep. he's like, oh, the underwriters figured out there were some additional ways to save because I think they got nervous I was going to move the account. There are th big decisions that you can make with your resources to make sure you're not getting busy doing nothing. But you have to keep your eye on the ball and make sure you're focusing on those things that matter. If you are laser focused on trying to cut the weekly latte out of your budget, and on the other hand, you're not out there maximizing the employer match in your yeah. 401k plan. You are missing the mark on the things that are truly impactful in your financial circumstance. So make sure that you keep your eye on the ball and understand what big decisions you should be focusing on when it comes to your finances. So let's drop down to number five. Know where you are. Man, this is one, if you could say what's our greatest hits of things that we talk about, Bo. This is a big one. It's really the value and power of the big picture with net worth statements. Uh, we think that the net worth statement is the, and, and I, I don't think this is an overstatement, it is the cornerstone yeah. of solid financial management, understanding where you are, where you've been, and where you're going. It's definitely foundational because it does, and I've already mentioned it once on the show, but I think it's worth repeating. There is something in the subconscious that if you will just write down your goals, record, and then start tracking progress, you're going to look back and you're like, well, I don't remember changing anything behaviorally but somehow I woke up something yep. that is just generate. If you do a net worth statement, it is amazing how much of that stuff is just going to happen for you because 
This brain has a lot more going on while we sleep, while we're processing, yep. while you're watching Dancing with the Stars. There's things going on up here. Wake that beast up. I can't tell you how many friends I have. I'll say, hey, you got to start this network statement. Here, here's how you do it. And we'll tell you in a second how to do it. And they'll say, hey, well, I've, I've got these two old 401k accounts and this old simple IRA from these past jobs. And like, where do I put those on my network statement? I say, and I say, it's great that you found right. those, but... That is now drawing light to these soldiers that you left behind. Your net worth statement can also be that thing that lets you know when you aren't maximizing opportunity. So if you're not doing it every single year, you really, really, really ought to, ought to be doing it. And so the question becomes, how do I do a net worth statement? Right. We tried to, we wanted to still distill this down so it was very simple, as simple and easy as possible. So we have a three-step intern Daniel illustration here. Number one, <laughs> list all of your assets. And this includes cash accounts, investments, your automobile, your home, personal property, furs, collectibles. Anything you have that is an asset, something that you own that has value, list that. Yep. Next thing, step number two, list all your liabilities, any money that you owe. Including Hopefully it's a short list. Mortgage, car loan. Oh, credit card debt. It even pains me to say it out loud because you shouldn't have credit you, you card shouldn't. debt. That's a, that's a four-letter word. It's a four-letter word with a bunch more letters than four. Uh, <laughs> student loans, any other debt, you want to list all your liabilities. And then here is the magic. You take number one and you subtract number two. That's your net worth. That's the magic number you're looking at trying to calculate. Yeah, and the big goal is you want to see liquid assets going up every year. You want to see debt coming down, and you definitely want to see an increase in that net worth. That's exactly Because right. the ultimate goal, here's the game, guys, you want that increase in net worth to be more than you made in actual earned income because that very likely means your army of dollar bills is getting to the point that you have financial independence. That's a powerful insight. I, just, I want to say that again because you said it so well. If you're someone who makes, I'm going to make up a number, $50,000 a year, and when you track your net worth statement, if your net worth went up more than $50,000 a year from last year, it is almost as though every dollar that you made went to savings. That is incredible. It means your army's really busy it's making money for you. It's working harder than you are. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. That leads to number four. Understanding that debt sucks, but sometimes it's just unfortunately necessary. Uh, yeah, I think that this is... All right, I'm going to say this. This is going to... It's not... I don't, it shouldn't be controversial. Right, right. But this is the number one thing that we think that, that Dave Ramsey really gets right. Right, right. Sort of. Because we think that it is possible. This is where we differ a little bit. It is possible to have a healthy relationship with debt and debt instruments. Well, I think debt is one of those things that we've talked about. We've used analogies, whether it's knives, we've talked about chainsaws, is that it is a very dangerous tool that's in your, your utility belt of financial success. And, and, and I've even, I've, I've been confessional that my first house, I didn't put down 20%. Right. I put down 5%. I think we've, a lot of us here in the office, and I think that shocks people. I've also done content where I said, look, I get it. When you're in your late 20s, early 30s, you got a few kids, you just bought a house, money's just not laying around, right. and all of a sudden the car breaks down, and you're like, how the heck? You don't want to go buy a hoopty that, yeah, it might be paid for for 1000 or 2000 bucks, but do you want to put your family in this when you're not around, the answer is probably no. So it, there are going to be times where you might have to go buy a car and mm -hmm. use debt. So yep. we've tried to at least be very creative and come up with very smart ways that you can use debt responsibly so you don't get yourself in trouble. Absolutely. And that includes, I give you permission to use credit cards, but you're going to pay them off monthly. Yep. It's too much I mean, it's predatory in the interest rates that they charge in those things, so you never want to be carrying interest. When you're talking about car loans, to keep you honest on these things, you're never buying luxury brands unless you can pay them like cash over the next 12 exactly months. Right. I'm talking about normal functional vehicles. You're going to put down 20%. Mm -hmm. You're going to amortize them over three years, yep. and then you're going to make sure that your car debt in total for the entire household does not exceed 8% of your gross income. That's all automobiles, not 8% per car. That's all automobile costs cannot exceed 8%. You know, so we give you these rules over and over again and then realize mortgage debt so you don't get out over your skis mm -hmm. and you buy too big of a house never should exceed 25% of your total income. That's right. So if you'll just follow these rules, I think you will find out that you're in a great place. Now, I do throw out the caveat. I love paying down debt. Huge proponent of paying down debt. I don't want you to consider yourself financially independent unless you're completely debt-free. 
However, here's the asterisk. Here's the thing that I always put the footnote is, in. Is this the, I was trying to put the asterisk there. You know, that's why I was putting all the angles. <laughs> is that when you're 20 to 40 years of age, the dollar value, the opportunity cost, the compounding growth mm-hmm. potential is so huge. I don't want you to get in a hurry paying down 3.5% mortgage debt. Yep. I want you to think about the army of dollar bills getting growing and being deployed and being a useful resource. You will have plenty of time in your late 40s, your early 50s, pay off that yep. debt then on those high, on those low interest mortgage rates. It's worth repeating. I know that's controversial to some, but I promise you, fast forward 10 years, 15 years, and you're going to be like, wow, I could pay off the mortgage and then some because of that spread between the 3.5% and then the more money. I didn't tell you not to get out of debt. That's I just right. said, let's do it smart. I think you said it absolutely perfectly, Brian. Uh, he, he, this, this is the money guy view. It's okay to have a mortgage. It's okay to have student loan debt. It's okay to have auto loan debt. And it's okay to use credit cards. What it's not okay to do is allow those things to run rampant and go completely um, un- uncovered, unwatched, unlooked over, unrestrained. If you're someone who can't pay off your credit cards every month, by all means, don't do it. Absolutely, 100% don't do it. If you go try to buy a house, but you don't keep the mortgage payment below 25%, you don't need to buy that house. If you can't pay off a luxury car inside of 12 months, you don't need to do that. But if you're someone who falls in the camp where you can do those things, it's okay. And sometimes it's, it's even a necessary evil. It's all about healthy relationship. We are, we understand our content is for the empire builders. We're looking for that 20% of the American population that understands and has self-control, has discipline, and goes, why do my neighbors just not have enough going on? You're not keeping up with the Joneses. You're building the millionaire next door. You're building the everyday millionaires. You don't have these struggles. Now, if you are somebody who has these struggles, go back, get the basics under control, Come back and join the financial mutants that can be part of that 20%. That's why we try to create this content to help you out with that. So let's move on to number three, which is automate your financial life. Now, this isn't uh, because I know I know all seven of these because, you know, I was kind of in the (laughs) pre-show meeting. Um, This one is, I think, the second most powerful one. Now we put it number three because number two is very, very important. Yeah. Yeah. But when I recognized this early on in my financial life about automating my financial life, about getting money going to places first and setting it on autopilot so that I personally could not screw it up, it changed the game for me. It is. Because I remember when I first graduated out of college, I said, okay, well, I'm just gonna do this and do that and whatever's left over, I'm gonna save. I'm gonna put that away. I'm gonna save that for the future. It's amazing how quickly those holes in your pocket just expand and that money disappears by the time you get it's to the end of the month. It's death from a thousand paper cuts. Exactly Everything right. costs three to five dollars. You can go get you a new coffee. You can go, you know, buy. You, when you go get gas, you'll buy a pack of gum. Yep. I mean, it's just I, I, there's a reason that if you have it, if you pay yourself last, there won't be anything That's left exactly over. Right. There is a reason when we talk about automated savings, we're talking about pay yourself yep. first. So, you know, and, and we have a slide on this that's so powerful. It, I, wanted, it, I want you to give you time to jump into it. If you can do this right, it actually makes building wealth, building abundance, being an empire, an empire builder really, really easy. So this is what we laid out. We said, okay, if you want to be a millionaire by the time you reach 65, how much do you need to save? And you're going to notice a trend for those who start early and set it up yep. automatic early on. If you're a 20-year-old and you can make 10%, we say you can make 10% in your 20s, 9% in your 30s, 8% in your 40s, 7 in your 50s, 6% in your 60s. So it is declining as you get yeah, older. Yeah, because right. you, you should take some risk off the table. How much would you have to save on a monthly basis to get to a million dollars by the time you get to 65? If you're in your 20s, it's only $95 a month, less than one single Benjamin Franklin. $95 it's incredible. A I mean, I think anybody has that potential. At 25, it's still very doable, but look at how much of a difference just five years makes. It goes from 95 up to $158. At 30, you need to be saving $340 a month. At 35, almost $550 a month. At age 40, now you've crossed into four digits. If yeah, you, if you, have you to wait. save a thousand bucks a month, a thousand fifty one. That's incredible. That's exactly right. At 45, it goes up to 1700. At 50, 
now it's starting to maybe get a little bit hard. You got to save $3,000 a month if you wait until your 50s to get serious about it. And then at 55, you got to save almost $5,800 a month to reach millionaire status by the time you get to 65. Here's another way to use this as a tool for you. For you, especially when I always, here's the thing I always struggle with. When I was in my 20s, I always was like, man, it is just, I, I feel so unfortunate. I just didn't start with much money, I didn't have resources. I just, I, I know at some point in the future, I'll make more money. I could do more. That's when I'll start saving. Here's what I want you to understand. Compare, say your boss is a 40-year-old and you're 20 years of mm -hmm. age. Your boss, to get the exact same benefit that you're working towards, will have to save $1,051, whereas your goal is 95. 95. That it. shows how much more powerful your dollar, every dollar you put to work in your 20s Compared to your 50-year-old or 40-year-old boss, it is no, I mean, you're smoking them. Uh, if you can just put the money to work, you are smoking your bosses, and that will help you. Because then you can look back when you're in your 40s, when you're in your 50s, mm -hmm. and go, man, every dollar I put to work in my 20s and 30s has a purpose, was very powerful. And it's not like, it's one of those things, when I read like Everyday Millionaires, and they talk about most people hit seven-figure status with their tax-deferred account. And that yeah. makes sense because you're getting your free match from your employer. But it's not one of those things where you wake up and, you, and I've, I've had this happen to me. Is you're like, how did that account get so big? I know I'm making decent contributions now, but that's not, that's not that's how this not happened. That's not what's doing it. It didn't get to six figures because I was saving this much. This happens after my, my careers got, increase and I can maximize the 401k. It hit six figures because I started saving in my 20s. Guys, don't take that away from yourself. You can do that in your 20s and 30s. You can see it with these numbers right here. Now, Brian, you, you said something. I want, I want to take a, just a moment to pause, and I want to talk to some of our older listeners because we always get a little bit of negative feedback whenever we show this slide because they say, well, I'm not in my 20s anymore. Yeah. I'm, not in my, I'm not 25. I'm not 30. You said something this morning, and I don't think you know that you said it, uh -oh. and it hit me, and it floored me because uh -oh. I never think about it in these terms. You said, okay, well, if you're someone who's 65 and you're about to retire, but you're going to live until 95. Yeah. Some portion of your portfolio has 30 years to work for you. Yeah. Some portion, if you're in your 50s, of your portfolio has 40s. So even if you're late to the game, and even if you're in your 40s and 50s, don't think, oh, well, if I, I can't save $3,000 a month because I'm not going to get that. What you can save, if you can let that money work for you for 10, 20, 30, 40 years into retirement, you can still have this. This can still happen for you if you have the time to let your dollars grow for you. This is another reason you don't go, just because you retire doesn't mean you go, oh, I'm putting in my notice, I get the gold watch, and I'm going to cash. That's right. That's I mean, exactly right. Because you know your money will probably be working for the next 30 to 40 years. Yep. If you have the retirement you've planned for, we need a portion of it to keep growing and letting this compounding interest be powerful for you. Let's move on to number two, covering all your bases through risk management. That's right. Uh, this one is not as exciting as thinking about automating, but it's, it's probably more important. There's yeah. a reason that anytime a new, a new person reaches out to us about becoming a client and working with us, before we start talking about portfolio and investments and tax strategy, if they have people that are depending on their incomes or depending on them to provide, whether it be young children or spouses, we always ask the risk questions first sure. before we talk about the abundance and wealth building questions because we think that's how the financial planning order of operations should go. And we're talking about homeowner's insurance, your auto insurance. We're talking about disability, yep. life insurance, all these things. Umbrella, we've done shows on every one of these topics. Make sure you're looking at it. I mean, it's very easy because I will tell you, it breaks my heart when I hear about young people that have, unfortunately, through bad circumstances, health crises, mm -hmm. accidents, lose somebody way too early. It's already an emotional to toll on the family. Why make it a financial toll right. when term life insurance, if you could just do 10 times your income yep. plus any big debt that you're nervous about, like a mortgage, mm -hmm. you're going to be shocked at how cheap it is. Notice I did not say whole life insurance. I said term life insurance. And based that length of term, typically 20 years mm -hmm. is what is, is probably very efficient, but you can do 30-year term, you can do 10-year term. Look at how long you think somebody will be relying upon your income. So that's covering your bases from like the risk management standpoint. But then there's even another type of covering your bases. And this is the next thing we move mm -hmm. to. We might meet with someone and says, hey guys, I, uh, 
I've done great. I've built up this really healthy portfolio and I'm going to retire in three to four years. And we're like, awesome. That's great. Let's talk about that. Uh, tell us a little about your portfolio. And be like, oh, I'm 100% stocks. Yeah. I got a bunch of individual stocks and, I, and you have to recognize that part of covering your bases and part of risk management is making sure that you understand the relationship between risk tolerance and risk capacity and how those two have to be married when it comes to ultimately achieving your financial goals. Well, it is a fine line because I don't want you thinking, okay, because it's, it's back to that analogy, is just because you turn 65 or 60 and you've retired, you don't go 100% cash because mm -hmm. you will have money that will continue to work for 30 years. But here is what I'm trying to protect you from. Market gets crushed like in 2008. You're not panicking, where is the my money going to come from for the next three to seven years? Right. You know when it's taken care of through the diversification of your portfolio. It's also, and I, let me give you one, one other analogy, because I used this with somebody recently, and, and this is a sport, it's college football season. If you know you're dominating the other team that you're playing, and I know it's boring football, but fourth quarter, oh, yeah. what yep. does the coach start doing? They don't throw the ball anymore. Nope. They start running the ball to try to run the clock. They start punting, you know, trying to keep it away from the opponent, keep the opponent off the field. It is, but they play prevent defense. Yep. It is boring, boring, boring. But you know what? They win the game. That's right. And that, that there's a, so much. I want you to continue to walk that line. There's a balance there of growing your assets. But when you've won, make sure you have a plan mm -hmm. to ensure you're not taking too much risk. Because I have seen a lot of horror stories where people have won the game and then done something stupid you know, with an adult child yep. or something else and they lose it all and it breaks your heart. So it's, don't fall into that. It's showboating on the way home. You've already crossed third. All you got to do is touch the plate and you just screw it up before you get there. So um, I, I was trying to do a sports analogy. Your college football is better. I tried really hard. Ray, you see how I tried to get that one in there? You're trying to get a baseball analogy I was trying to get a there. baseball analogy in there. By the way, Bo was a college athlete, in case y'all didn't know. Uh, a thousand years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Number one. Now this one. You can tell I don't have rhythm. Wait, hey, Did you hear how bad that was? More, There's no more, rhythm. That was more. Make sure uh, we order an actual drum set for the desk for the next. Because that's the second drum roll we've done today, and neither one of them have turned out very. Yeah, very you can good. tell I was not part of the drum line. That's for <laughs> sure. But number one, understand. Now I really do consider this powerful. Deferred gratification. Yep. When I go speak to high school classes, that's actually kind of this channel started from multiple things. Is that I was I was trying to get into high school classes within my hometown because I just felt like that needed to be part of curriculum. Yep. If kids could just understand how money worked, it would probably fix a lot of societal woes because yep. just so many people don't understand money. So somehow we have birthed this incredible online platform that reaches thousands of people. But this is the main concept that was driving this for yep. many years. I just want people to understand if you'll just take a little tiny bit of today for a great, huge tomorrow, incredible things happen. And, and the earlier you get this, the sooner you recognize this, the less of today you have to sacrifice. At your 20s, you only have to sacrifice about $95 Just of today. Just a little bit. In your 40s, now you got to start sacrificing some bigger today. It's, it's a little Just, bit bigger chunk. Just a little bit. In your 50s, it gets even bigger. You, you, the level of gratification you have to defer shrinks if you can start earlier. And if you can just put that in place, it is an amazing, amazing, amazing thing that will change your financial situation. So the reason this turned into a drum roll is that we did pre-show meeting. And I was like, guys, it's good. I was talking about, but we need an educational concept. So we enlisted Daniel. Yep. And we showed him some research we did back in 2011 from a presentation I did mm -hmm. to a 401k. Yep. And this is what, let's go ahead and roll out what Daniel came up with. So we're calling this the power of investing early. And we do this as a case study. So uh, <laughs> let's assume that you have two individuals. I'm going to try to describe this really well for our folks out there in audio world who can't see the illustration. So if I, if I don't explain something, stop me so we okay. can talk about it for the podcast listeners. We have two different types of savers. We have early bird Edgar and late to the party Lenny. Believe they it or not, like really nerdy dudes. Me and Brian did pictures. not come up with those names. That is an intern Daniel special. I think well, he profiled them looking at me. So what? They, my, well, my Halloween edition, maybe. What they want to do is they're both going to max out Roth IRAs, but they're not going to do it at the same time. Okay. So early bird Edgar, he's going to get out of college and he's going to start saving at age 22, and he's only going to save until he turns 30. He says, "You know what? I'm going to 
defer some gratification, but by the time I get to 30, I've earned it. I'm going to stop saving. So, so I'm going to save saving for nine years, nine years. I'm going to save $54,000 from the time I'm 22 all the way until the time I'm 30. And the reason it's, 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 we're doing $6,000 a year, which is Roth contributions, guys. Yep. We want to encourage you to do Roth IRAs. They're very powerful. So this person, early bird Edgar is doing this for Nine years, $6,000 a year, so he's invested $54,000. That's right. So then there is late to the party Lenny. Now, this is what Lenny says. Whoa, I just got out of school. I've earned my right to be able to go out, do the things I want to do, see the world, yada, yada, yada. I'm not going to start saving in my 20s because I want to enjoy my 20s. Instead, I'm going to start saving when I turn 31 years old, but I'm going to be really good at it. And I'm going to save from the time I'm 31 all the way until I save 65, and I'm going to do $6,000 every year. So unlike my counterpart, Edgar, I'm actually going to save $210,000 over that 34, 35-year period. One thing I think is interesting about this, and I th his picture doesn't show it, but old Lenny, he actually, his nickname should be early to the party, late to the savings game. Because, I mean, there's a reason he took off those first years in his 20s. Obviously, Lenny was really interested in making sure that he was enjoying his 20s. So what could be wrong with that? So here is the question that we had. Let's assume they both earn the same amount of money. We're not going to change the rates of return. They're going to earn 8% on their investment. So here's the question. Who had more money in their Roth IRA at retirement? Is it Edgar, who saved $54,000, or is it Lenny, who saved $210,000. Well, remember, Edgar invested $54,000. Lenny invested $210,000. The amount that Edgar had at retirement... Look at that. One point three, almost one point three million dollars. So fifty four thousand turned into one point three, but he only saved fifty four. Surely Lenny, who saved what's that like four, almost yeah, almost four, four times, times as much. Yeah. Surely he has a lot more. No, he only has one point one five million dollars at retirement. It's still great. Don't Lenny's if you're a Lenny they're out both there. Both millionaires. They're both millionaires, but look at how much less Edgar had to save than Lenny. And he actually ended up with more at retirement. You got Lenny over here, behaviorally incredible discipline. Yep. You know, because he did this for 35 years. That's so powerful that he had this behavior going, but he should. He missed out a huge opportunity cost that those first few years was a tremendous loss opportunity. So what's there has to be a better way to do this. Yeah, we think that, that Lenny actually had the behavior down, but what if Lenny decided not to squander his time? He took to heart number six, and he was efficient with his time. What if instead of waiting until 31, he started investing at 22, and he didn't stop? Now, all he saved was $6,000 every year from the time that he was 22 all the way until he turned 65. At retirement, Lenny would have almost two and a half million dollars. Yeah, it's pretty Lenny powerful. got the best of both worlds simply because he started early and he stayed consistent. Guys, building abundance, building a financial empire really is that easy. And it can start small too. That's what I always like when I'm breaking out planning suggestions for, for anybody. I'm always like, don't try to eat the elephant all at once. Think about what things you can do. That's why we start small. Saving $6,000 a year in a Roth IRA, that is somewhat aspirational when you first come out of school. But if you look at yourself growing over the years, definitely doable and it can become powerful. Yep. So let that be the, the building blocks for success, which is built off of understanding deferred gratification. Take a little bit of today for an awesome tomorrow. I promise you, your future self will thank you for it. Nobody at retirement looks back and goes, you know what? I really screwed up by starting that 401k when Wish I was 23 I years old. That was a huge mistake. Why did I, we do? That's one of the questions we ask prospects. What's your greatest mistakes? I mean, what's your greatest things that you've done financially and what's the biggest mm -hmm. mistakes? Not one person has said, I wish I would have not invested when I was young. They always, that's actually the best. I'm glad that I started early. Yep, I'm absolutely. glad I did it often. I mean, those are the things, that is the cornerstone of why we talk about what we do. So make sure you take advantage of it. So we think there are seven financial habits that you can use to change life. I'm just going to run through them. Number seven, be a lifetime learner. Number six, be efficient with your resources. Number five, Five, know where you are, where you are. That's the cornerstone, the net worth. Number four, understand that debt sucks, but sometimes it's necessary. Number three, 
automate your financial life, be a hyper saver. Number two, make sure all of your bases are covered. And number one, if you can grasp the concept of deferred gratification, the sky is the limit. So, guys, and I, I go break my heart when somebody puts right in the comments section, they go list those seven, and that does not do it justice <laughs> because there are so many teachable moments, some nuggets of wisdom there that will not make it when the table of contents gets published on the full show. But it will happen, and I'll just, I'll just roll with it. But that leads to, I want to tell you guys, if you think that we're giving away a lot here, you got to go to moneyguy.com and check out the brand new resource oh, page because yeah. we get point. so excited about this. This is one of those things... We are hooking you up with the knowledge so that you can hopefully figure out how you can come, learn, apply, and grow mm -hmm. and build yourself into a level of success. That's the abundance cycle. And part of that abundance cycle is us creating a resource page on our website mm -hmm. that has completely free things that you can download. And we're updating them often. That's I mean, right. we got the whole team trying to add stuff on a constant basis. Yep. So you need to come back often. Just like you want to save early and save often, you want to come back to our resource page often because it's constantly getting updated. Exactly right. And then, you know, part of that abundance cycle, when I talked about the success that you go reach right up here, when you get to that point, you're going to look around and go, man, I have built something pretty amazing. It's gotten to the point I just don't have the hours in the day or this thing's getting complicated or I'm just worried about screwing it up. We're going to hopefully at that point, you're going to pay us back and remember the abundance cycle and say, I want to work with those guys that hooked me up for all those years because we've been doing this since 2006. And you'll reach out to the Money Guy team, the Abound Wealth financial planning team, and we, because we love working with clients all across the country. It's truly a powerful, powerful thing. Now, if you're out there listening in iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Audio World, and you don't check out the YouTube, uh, every other Tuesday, we actually do a live stream. We have a live audience right now with us doing this. At the end of this recording, we're going to press stop on the recording. We're going to do a live Q&A. We're going to answer some questions. So if you're someone out there listening and you have questions and you want to get some awesome Money Guy swag, uh, the Tumblr that uh, money can't buy. Can I say that? <laughs> yeah, we Money don't sell can't them. buy this. We only give them away. If you want to get a Tumblr, come check out our live stream every other Tuesday. Uh, join us. Let us answer some questions. We're just so happy to be here and be a resource for you guys. So keep writing emails. Keep going to the Contact Us page. Go check out the resource page. Money Guy Team out.